Thank you for joining CCIH's forum, Faith-Based Organizations Adapting to a Warming World, Community Approaches to a Global Crisis. My name is Beth Good, and I am the director of the Master's in Nursing program at Eastern Mennonite University. If you are new to Christian uh, Connections for International Health, we're an international network of approximately 115 Christian organizations and 15 affiliated partners, as well as a few hundred individual members, all working in over 90 countries. CCIH's mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective and provides opportunities for capacity building, networking, fellowship, and advocacy. This forum is hosted by CCIH's Community-Based Prevention and Care Working Group, which I'm a member of. Before we begin, I'd like to make just a few housekeeping comments. We'd love for you to introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us where you're joining from. Today, we'll have a roundtable discussion with our speakers, followed by about 25 minutes of Q&A and discussion. We do want to hear your thoughts and ideas about this pressing topic. So please use the chat box on Zoom to type your questions and we'll answer as many as we can. And you can do that throughout the presentation. Just keep adding them to the chat box. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the CCIH YouTube channel and posted to the CCIH website, www.ccih.org. Click on events and then look for webinar recordings. You'll also get an email with the link to the recording uh, once it's posted. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to start by setting the stage. The World Health Organization recently recognized climate change as the single biggest health threat facing humanity. This makes measures such as climate adaptation crucial since reversing the phenomenon is not possible, but mitigating its effects and preparing for the impact is. Climate change has a large negative effect on those in low and middle income countries, increasing the already existing inequities and injustices. Many faith-based organizations or FBOs are experiencing this firsthand in their communities and programs and believe that action is essential. The weight of this topic is heavy, so we would like to begin this forum by listening to a, me a message of hope from climate ex expert, Catherine Hayhoe, who is an atmospheric scientist, on why Christians should care about climate with a message of hope. You may need to turn up your volume a little bit um, to hear as the video is, is a little bit on the quiet side. is to be to love other people. So why do I care about a changing climate? Because God has made us responsible, I believe, for every living thing, which includes people and because it affects real people today, especially those who are poor and vulnerable who did the least to contribute to this problem. So what else does my faith tell me? My faith also helps me with how to respond because when we're confronted with this overwhelming issue of climate change, our first response is often fear. We're presented with apocalyptic visions of what the world will look like if climate change continues unchecked. We are also presented with apocalyptic visions of what the world will look like if we fix it. The economy will be destroyed. Nobody can drive or have any water or eat any meat or travel. So we're faced with competing apocalyptic visions of the world and it just makes us wanna pull the blankets up over our head. Often our defense mechanism is just to shut off because there's only so much bad news we can absorb, especially if we feel like we're only one person who can't fix it on our own. But what the Bible tells me is that we are not to respond out of fear or out of guilt, but out of love and hope. And there's actually a verse about this. One of my favorite verses is that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So when I experience fear, my litmus test is that is not from God. What God has given us are three tremendous gifts, a spirit of power. What does power do? It empowers us to act. 
What does fear do? It paralyzes us. It might help us run just fast enough to get away from the bear, but long-term fear is a paralyzing emotion. God has given us power to act, love to care for others more than ourselves and have compassion on those who are suffering, and, as a scientist, my favorite one, a sound mind to make good decisions using the data and the information that science gives us. So let me ask you this. I want to ask you, give me a word or you can join the words together. What gives you hope? What gives you hope? If you're going to use multiple words, make sure you connect them with a dash or a dot. But I want to hear your story because one of the biggest ways that I get hope is from having conversations with other people and hearing from them really interesting things that are happening or that they're doing or something that somebody else did. To know that I'm not alone, that we're all acting together. So, what gives us hope? I am not surprised to see kids, youth, Greta, children, and people here. I am not surprised at all. In fact, there's a there's been some conversations lately about should I have children because of climate change because every additional human carries an additional carbon footprint and my answer when I was asked that is without children we have no hope if you've ever seen a movie called children of men where nobody can have children anymore it is the most hopeless despairing world now we don't need to go out and have 12 children you know the the commandment to you know be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth accomplished check done that but without without children why would i be motivated to change the world so i love that i'm seeing this come out and we're also seeing faith compassion jesus god wisdom um technology yep technology gives me hope i love hearing about new technology i really do and i love seeing very specific things there too fantastic so i have a perspective on hope that I get it from talking to other people, but in the Bible, it also talks about hope, and it talks about it in a really unusual way. So here's what it says in Romans 5. It says, suffering, it starts with suffering. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint. Isn't that a bit of a different order than you'd think? So hope is something that we can grow. And I have shared with you from my own heart what I believe. But a few years ago, I was asked by the American Geophysical Union, our scientific society, to host a blog for Faith and Climate Week, talking about how our faith informs the science that we do. And so what I did was I went and I collected a few different colleagues. I wrote a paragraph from a uh, Protestant perspective. I had a colleague write a paragraph from a Catholic perspective. I had Asma write a paragraph from a Muslim perspective. And she wrote about how, as a scientist and a person of faith, she's always felt the calling, a calling towards obligation to justice, which is really what climate change is all about. And she quoted from the Quran about how we've been appointed guardians of the earth. Exact same concept, totally different words, identical concept. And then my friend and colleague Vaishali, who's Hindu, she wrote about the concepts of dharma and the concepts of karma and the idea of doing our part to care for and treat with respect every aspect of living things on earth. Totally different words, exact same concept. And then at an AGU meeting, I had a colleague uh, email me ahead of time and say, I'd like to meet with you. And usually I meet with colleagues to talk about research projects or things like that. And I didn't have anything going on with him at the moment, but I said, sure, I'd love to have lunch with you. So I walked in, and I sat down at the table, and he leaned across the table to me, and he said, I'm a humanist, but I care about climate change, too. I said, well, of course you do. And he said, I care about people. I care that it is profoundly unfair. It affects people who have done nothing to contribute to the problem. And that is why I'm doing everything I can, not just to study the science, but to study the solutions, too, because I'm a humanist. All we have to be is a human to care about climate change because we care about our brothers and sisters here and around the world. What unites us is far more than what divides us today. And so caring about climate change is a profoundly human thing. So to close with the words of one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall, after a long career in science, she said this only a few years ago. She said, it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony 
that we can achieve our full potential. So when I talk about climate change, not just the science, but the solutions and our attitudes towards them, my favorite title is this. Thank you. What a great way to orient us uh, to the beginning of this forum, a message that moves us from fear to hope. And thank you, Jane Otai, um, for your comment that faith that God is in control is one of the things that she um, responded to uh, the video when she was asking the words of hope that we have. So thank you for that. Now we'll have an opportunity to hear from speakers who represent faith-based organizations operating in Pakistan and Haiti, countries that are highly vulnerable to extreme weather events. Our first speaker is Dan Irvin. Dan Irvin is country director for World Hope International, providing leadership and program focus on health, education, and child protection. He is also an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church and has more than 40 years of ministry experience as pastor, Christian educator, missionary, and administrator. Thank you for being with us today, Dan. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm so grateful to uh, uh, CCIH to um, op provide this opportunity <laughs> Uh, to share from our corner of the world. I'm not a climate scientist, but I am a researcher and an observer with more than 40 years experience in the Haiti context. And I have literally watched this crisis develop through the years. I guess that means my only credentials that I've been around a long time. So you have to listen to me. According to uh, Columbia's climate school reports that are entitled State of the Planet, Haiti is considered one of the three most vulnerable countries in the world to the impacts of climate change, along with Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. Uh, in fact, some of those um, indexes have it as the most vulnerable country in the world. Uh, my particular point of reference for this conversation is a 60 bed hospital located on the island of Lagwanov, about 40 miles west of the capital city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Lagunov is part of Haiti's West Department and is fairly large with an estimated population of about 120,000 people. And you can see it on the map there underneath the E of the city of Ansangale. The hospital is the only one on the island and the immediate catchment area is, has a population of about 80,000 people. Uh, the island's population has been increasing lately because of internal displacement caused by gang violence on the main island and increasing deportations of Haitians from the Dominican Republic. Uh, any individual who has a family history or family roots on the island uh, when forced to flee uh, return to their ancestral home. The hospital operates an outpatient clinic, infectious disease wards, um, recently responding to COVID-19 and now unfortunately uh, cholera, and is also host for a number of special programs for HIV, TB, maternal health, and provides support for other clinics and community health programs. Our chaplaincy program connects with local churches and is currently teaching chaplains, pastors, and volunteers um, how to respond in crises and in grief situations. The hospital also supports a community health initiative using a modified CHE model, uh, serving communities all over the island with more than 40 volunteer committees working in their local communities. The hospital is becoming a hub for community development as well as a medical facility. Next slide. The as a small island state, Haiti is already subject to the effects of rising ocean levels and other impacts of climate change, but it also sits in the middle of the Atlantic hurricane corridor. Uh, historically, Haiti is frequently hit by tropical storms or hurricanes. You may remember in 2008, 
Haiti was devastated by four hurricanes within a 30-day period of time. According to Columbia's climate report, we have to consider the climate impacts in the context of Haiti's high population density, fragile ecosystems, overstressed water resources, and limited institutional capacity. Back to the hospital and the surrounding community, here are some of the impacts that are observable in the immediate context of the island and the hospital community. The food supply is directly impacted by rain cycles, drought, and flooding uh, for land-based agriculture and also for fishing in the coastal waters. As fish, uh, the local conch, which they call lambi, and the Caribbean clawless lobsters are all staples of their diet. Water supply is also impacted by both flood and drought, changes in the weather cycles and increasing demand. Uh, general, general safety concerns, including flooding, mudslides, wind, and heat extremes. Environmental issues include drought. Uh, drought exacerbates deforestation. Uh, climate change is impacting the reefs that surround the island. Erosion that washes topsoil away. Also, uh, it also becomes a pollutant in the fragile reef ecosystems. A desert disease burden is increased by storms and flooding, especially cholera and malaria risks, but also other mosquito-borne diseases like chikungunya and Zika. Uh, next slide. Um, on the island, the once predictable rain cycles are no longer predictable. Farmers are at more risk than at any time previously to capricious weather extremes prolonged drought and furious storm events. In the 2008 storm season, as much as 60% of Haiti's total food production was destroyed. And the more recent Hurricane Matthew in 2016 destroyed virtually all crops and even fruit trees for the entire Southern Peninsula of Haiti. On the island of Laganov, the people of the town around surrounding the hospital are very dependent on food grown in the mountains and the fish from the sea. Near the hospital is an area that they call simply the saline, which means the salt flats. And this is where the most vulnerable people of the island live, in tiny houses built from whatever materials can be gleaned from the environment near the sea. Much of this land area is occasionally flooded with spring and high tides, spring high tides and summer storm surges. But these events seem to be increasing in both in severity and duration. Next slide. The hospital is located just a few hundred yards from the ocean and the underlying groundwater is brackish. The entire city of Asangale, a population of about 50,000 people, uh, surrounds the hospital and climbs the foothills towards the mountain ridge. There are very few freshwater wells on the island and one fairly large spring capture supplies most of the improved water supply to the city of Asangale where the hospital is located. Saltwater intrusion appears to be reducing areas where water wells can be dug, stretching the available water supply even further as both the population and the water demand continue to increase. Next slide. Um, so I wanna talk about the good news side of it, having uh, talked a lot about the bad news. Um, the hospital strategy to mitigate the effects of climate change involved three primary elements. First of all is the, the community health engagement uh, program of the hospital, uh, which addresses the people issue, the population. Um, the program consists of community health groups that meet regularly in more than 40 communities across the island. These groups help spread important information about health, nutrition, agriculture, family dynamics, and conflict resolution, as well as spiritual formation. The program is low cost, flexible, volunteer driven, and effective to raise awareness on a variety of important issues. The second strategic element is carefully planned capital investment. World Hope International and the Wesleyan Hospital have a long history of collaboration, which basically consisted of annual gift in kind medicine deliveries until 2019. At that time, World Hope entered into a long-term grant agreement with the hospital to address capacity issues known to the hospital administration 
and to mutually design and, and build out capital investments designed to reduce expenses, increase local revenue, and reduce vulnerabilities. Our first capital project together with a partner was to address the fragile freshwater issues of the hospital and surrounding community. We chose to partner with Give Power, a California-based NGO with connections to Tesla solar equipment and Catadyne water makers and the expertise to work in challenging under-resourced situations. Together, we, found, we funded a solar power desal unit capable of delivering about 70,000 liters of potable water daily made from seawater for the hospital and the surrounding community. This is a market-based project where users pay a few cents a gallon, but so efficient that it was cash flow positive in a few months and profitable in less than a year. The third element is intentional capacity building within the hospital staff and community leaders to give Loganov the people who are able to lead change and build community engagement to solve problems. Next slide. I'm sorry, keep that slide up. Um, the second capital investment was accomplished with the expertise of another partner, well known in Haiti, Build Health International, who designed and built a large solar array supported by a big Tesla battery charge controllers and inverters, giving the hospital virtual energy independence, greatly reducing energy costs from diesel generated power and virtually eliminating the high fuel cost and supply chain issues. An environmentally friendly solution with potential for carbon credit income. Next slide. A very significant tool to mitigate higher temperatures and increased exposure to storm damage is intentional build design that addresses these issues directly. Buildings designed for natural convection, shade on Southern and Western exposures, non-masonry top structures, uh, helping to avoid heat sinks. Th these designs allow for us, this design, these designs like the one you see in front of you also allow for significant water capture. Um, this is a, a quick uh, overview of the kinds of things that we have been doing to um, mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. Thank you, C CCIH, for this opportunity to share again from our little corner of the world. Thank you so much, Dan, for sharing your experience um, implementing community-based climate adaptation measures in Haiti. Please, um, participants, remember to add your questions to the chat box box as they come up and we'll add them to our list of questions. Um, yeah, I was just so impressed, Dan, with uh, just how you were able to pinpoint um, just the complexity of this issue and the ripple effects that it has. Um, it's not just um, climate. You were talking about food security and health and environmental and safe water, um, but you also um, were showing us how your organization is, is looking to, to bring hope into that situation by decreasing your carbon footprint, um, increasing potable water, capacity building, even your building designs. So that was, yeah, that was exceptional. We're now gonna move to our next speaker, Navid Kuram. Navid Kuram is the administrator of the Kunri Christian Hospital, the Rural Healthcare Project, which is part of the Diocese of Hyderabad Church in Pakistan. Navid has served at Kundri Christian Hospital since 2007, prioritizing climate mitigation and adaptation measures. The vision of Kundri is the provision of holistic healthcare services to all. So Navid, we welcome you. Feel free um, if you need to keep your camera off uh, to minimize your bandwidth issues, um, but welcome. We're anxious to hear from you. You'll need to unmute yourself. Navid, hello. I, oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, it's Navid Khuram. Good evening from Pakistan. I'm hopeful that everyone is fine and in good health. My name is Navid Khuram. I'm the administrator of Kunri Christian Hospital. It is a rural healthcare project of two churches, Roman Catholic and Church of Pakistan. So. 
the land belongs to Roman Catholic and the construction work is done by Church of Pakistan. So it is a good example of ecumenical relationship between the two churches. I'm thankful to CCIH for inviting me to share my experience about Health and Environment Link Initiative. We have started this initiative in 2016. The idea to initiate this initiative was based on the violent heat wave attacks in 2015. The attack have taken the lives of thousands of Pakistanis. And we, as a team, decided to do something to overcome these issues. So we had a brainstorming and we decided to plant as much possible tree as we can. So we introduced local species of plants like neem, pipal, moringa, so that the communities may also get benefit from these plant species. We have also uh, selected a land which is 15 kilometers away from the hospital, barren land. We have sprinkled thousands of seeds over there so that they could save us from the heat waves. Secondly, as you know that Pakistan is vulnerable to climatic factors. Recently, we have received a rainfall flooding because of the cloud bursting. And many Pakistanis displaced from their villages and the flood water is still inundated in the areas of the Pakistan. So climate change is affecting every country. And uh, now coming back towards the health and environment take initiative. So uh, we are thankful to Church of Scotland for supporting us in this initiative. If they would not have supported us, then it would be difficult to carry forward this activity. We have introduced a plant nursery where, uh, where we have uh, produced the saplings and then uh, when uh, the patients discharge from the hospital, we give them plants and after one year, we say that after one year, we will take back the uh, status of the plants. And uh, when we give the plants to them, we take one photograph. And after one year, we also take photograph. So we put the both photographs on the appreciation certificate of the hospital. And uh, we organize, after every year, we organize one appreciation certificate ceremony. And we appreciate those persons who have protected and nurtured the plants. We are, we wish to scale up our activities and we have a written proposal to various organizations and hopeful that they will support us and we will scale up our activities further. The challenges are many in Pakistan, but we are confident and uh, we are hopeful that our team members will do their best to promote environment and environmental activities. The future plans of the hospital are to provide high quality care, but not promising on the environment which is very crucial for everyone. And I often say that the climatic factors, they don't respect the boundaries, the floods, heat waves, and these, kind of active, uh, these kinds of disasters are everywhere they could attack. And as a Christian, we should have some uh, strategies to overcome these challenges and uh, we, our focus is on mother and child health, and uh, this is our hospital's uh, flag. And I say that this is human being. This is uh, 
uh, uh, revenue or the budgets, and this belongs to the environment, green color. So if we will promote the environment, definitely the environment will uh, be not uh, affecting us in the form of disasters. So we need to promote health and environment hand in hand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Navid, for sharing about uh, the impressive work at Kunri Hospital. Um, how I just love that idea of providing patients who are being discharged with trees and then encouraging them through the taking of pictures um, to, to nurture them and then celebrating that together. So um, yeah, so you're involving your entire community in this effort. I, I just really love that idea. So I do see a couple of questions have um, popped in here and we will move on to our question uh, answer and discussion. Um, but while questions are still coming in, I'd really like to welcome CCIH program advisor, Carolyn O'Brien, um, to share with us a quick note about CCIH um, and what they are doing in this area. So Carolyn. Thanks Beth. Um, I'm also anxious to get to the Q&A section, so I won't take up too much of your time, but just wanted to pop in to share some recent progress that CCIH has made in the area of climate adaptation. Earlier in 2022, CCIH undertook a landscape analysis to understand how its organizational members are addressing climate adaptation and identify capacity gaps in order to initiate engagement in this area. And I see our former intern, Emmanuel, in the chat who helped with this project. Nice to see you and thanks again for your help. Um, this effort included a literature review, a quantitative survey of organizational members and qualitative interviews. And the study focused mostly on low and middle income countries, although some of the gray literature um, covered US-based FBOs focused on climate. Um, the results mainly revealed that CCIH members and FBOs in general are addressing climate adaptation through five main areas, food security and agriculture, disaster and risk management, water sanitation and hygiene, public health systems, and tree planting. Um, which came out really clear. And it's clear today, even from our two speakers, that they fit under a couple of those areas. Um, and so there was a, but there was also a large range of what stage FBOs are in, in addressing climate. Um, some FBOs have large scale adaptation programs. Others are becoming more climate minded, incorporating their thinking, climate thinking into current programs. Um, and then there is a, a large amount of FBOs who are still evaluating the response options to determine how to get involved. Obviously, climate the climate crisis is huge and understanding how to get involved, how to become more climate minded or adapt your systems is quite a big project. And so I think we heard from a lot of FBOs that they're just not sure where to start. Um, but one thing was very clear, and there's a high motivation, uh, motivation from faith that FBOs uh, want to engage with climate adaptation programs, and there's a hunger to learn more. Um, also highlighted that more advocacy is needed to show the effectiveness of climate adaptation measures and the important link to human health. Um, so CCIH is planning, uh, we're in our planning stage for 2023 and thinking through how to, what our role might be in supporting our members and FBOs in climate adaptation. Um, we're taking a deeper look at the results from the landscape analysis and um, putting our heads together to think through what the next steps may be. Um, I will post a link to the landscape analysis if you want to look in more detail. We asked a lot more than what I shared today, including what terms people use when they're talking about climate um, and things like that. So I'll put that link there and also my email 
if you have questions or ideas that we should consider, please do reach out. We're um, really interested in, in delving more into this area. So thanks again. Um, thanks for letting me chat a little bit. And now I'm really excited to get to the discussion portion of this um, forum. So thanks for being here today and engaging in this important topic. Thanks, Carolyn, for sharing what CCIH is doing in this area. This is why we're all part of CCIH, because of some of these great um, endeavors that are happening. I see a lot of good questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the first one. Um, Navid, this is for you. The question is, what's the long-term plan for the those in the most vulnerable locations against extreme weather events, i.e. like severe flooding, heat waves? And this is from Emmanuel Ardiaba. Uh, unmute yourself, Navid. Hello. Uh, well, the long-term plan is to promote uh, planting more and more trees in the area. And secondly, uh, the local people here use the trees for making food, which is very much uh, against the environmental interventions. So the strategy is to uh, advocate towards solar panels and those uh, uh, things which are healthierly, which are healthy to environment. So we are uh, at the moment advocating to promote more and more trees. This is the uh, strategy at the moment. And in the near future, uh, if we will get some resources, uh, we will uh, advocate for adopting solar techniques and solar panels in the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Navid. It's also important for those of us who are not in those vulnerable locations to understand that it's also our responsibility. Um, so we need to keep that in mind as well. Okay, this question is for Dan. How easy or not are the activities in Haiti replicable in other fragile settings or scalable to more areas in Haiti? And that's from May. Yeah, I, that remains to be seen. Um, I think that the problems um, across Haiti are very similar to the ones that we encounter in our specific context. And so I would think that some of those would have um, um, potential um, impacts for mitigation as well. Um, I don't know about the, a lot of other places in the world, but I think it's a fairly common, based on our, our partners um, and their experience in other places around the world, the idea of, of uh, communities located near the ocean with brackish water, for instance, uh, and um, the alternative to uh, solar desal is, of course, diesel powered desal generation. Um, and so um, I, I would think that there are many places around the world where the issue of fresh water uh, could be uh, resolved by uh, going to solar powered desal. Um, there are lots of environmental impacts that I never thought about before we started working specifically on this issue. One of the things that we were doing is we were dumping used medicines into a big pit um, and, and began to realize that we're using the groundwater, the, the salty groundwater to make fresh water, but we are also now pumping water that we've been polluting with medicines for 70 years. And so the alternative is to burn them, which is another whole problem. So. Uh, it is complicated. I think there are, I, I think some of these things we're doing are, are scalable, not only in Haiti, but other places. Yeah, so I think you explained that there are some things to do, but it's not necessarily easy. Great. Um, so this was a combination of a couple of quest uh, questions from Ray Martin and seconded by, uh, by Kathleen Temple. 
Um, given that Christian faith and theology have led in many ways to the crisis, what do we mean when we say that God is in charge? Do Christian faith and theology help or harm our response to climate change or both? So this is for either, either one of you. I would say that both is the right answer. Um, in, in from my perspective, um, especially within the Protestant and evangelical churches, our um, our theology of of uh, care for the for the world, care for the environment, is underdeveloped at the very least. Um, I think our eschatology has something to do with that. The idea that we're going to we're going to leave this place, you know, uh, has created a harmful um, mindset in 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 many churches, um, and and sometimes reproduced in our mission organizations as well. Um, I I personally um, have done my best to try to advocate for a, a more robust understanding of creation care. Navid, would you like to? chime in on that? As a Christian, uh, I would say that uh, we need to work hard for promoting health and environment link. And uh, in the Bible, it is also revealed that as uh, we have to work for the promotion of environment and health, we need to take care of the health issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, this question is for you. How has climate change affected mental health in Haiti? How have you dealt with access to health facilities due to climate change? And this is from Jane Otani. Um, I, I think that, um, in the first part of my presentation, the bad news part, um, climate change is is adding to exacerbating the struggles of the of the people, especially the the lower the people in the uh, in the under resourced category in the country. Uh, it just adds more pain to their life, and there's no question about the fact that um, in the last um, ten years, based on a whole bunch of circumstances that the mental health issues are, are becoming more and more uh, apparent. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of um, mental health crises in the streets. And there's, um, I also mentioned lack of institutional capacity. That's an issue across the board in Haiti. Um, we're trying to do better at that. Uh, we don't have any specialists, uh, but we're trying to get training for some of our um, our um, doctors who specialize in, in family medicine uh, to, to equip themselves um, by training uh, to understand the medications involved in the process involved in providing uh, better um, mental health care at the hospital. Unfortunately, we don't have a specialist. We don't have a lot of capacity to do that, but all of the doctors are expressing the need for it as they're seeing younger and younger uh, people with um, complete um, psychotic breakdowns and a lot more issues in in maternal health related to postpartum. Um, the, another thing that we're doing is trying to educate our chaplain and, uh, uh, team and um, volunteers and other church leaders in the community in um, sharpening their skills in crisis counseling and grief counseling specifically. Great. Right. Navid, uh, I know this uh, question was specifically towards Haiti, but I would imagine that you're facing um, the same kind of increase in, in mental health um, issues related to the climate crisis. Could you speak into this as well? Well, uh, I would like to give you a little bit background that uh, uh, about climate uh, change and the mental health. Two years ago, we have conducted one medical camp here and we 
invited one expert psychiatrist and uh, he was saying that 80% of the patients are having mental diseases and uh, after that there was a covid period and we haven't conducted any medical camp and uh, still there are many issues uh, in the communities uh, i must say that we have received one patient and uh, she was a pregnant lady she was suffering with mental issues but the family was not thinking about this and they said there is an evil attack on the patient so they discharged the patient and after two or three days i came to know that the patient died because they have taken them towards a spiritual healer and he has beaten that lady and uh, to bring out the evil which is present in that according to them and she died so this is a very much complicated issue in this area because the the education literacy rate is very much low and uh, they think that there is no mental issues only there are some bad things or evils in the patient so this is my experience and <laughs> this i have shared with you thank you so much yeah that is that is definitely um yeah, something that adds to the complexity of, of all of the issues. Thank you for that. Uh, we would like to um, ask you some questions. We would like you um, to be able to answer some questions for us, the participants. Um, you can go ahead and raise your hand through Zoom and come off mute, um, or you can put your response in the, the chat box. Um, I actually am taking, uh, Earl Zimmerman sent a question for both, but I'm gonna kind of turn that back around and maybe ask Earl or someone else to answer. How do we relate climate adaptation to efforts to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions? What does that look like in the US as compared to someplace like Haiti or Pakistan or elsewhere? So I'm opening that up to all of the participants. This is Earl, I can respond. Uh, I mean, I, I struggle with that because uh, I, I know that most of the greenhouse gas emissions are, are created in rich countries or in rich communities like ours. And, and I'm working very actively here to try to help us you know, think through that and what that means for us. Then I also realize you know, that in places like Haiti uh, you know, and, and, and Pakistan, uh, you're often in the brunt of the climate crisis in the way that we're not. And so I'm just, I struggle with that. And so I, I, so I don't have a good answer. Uh, and how, you know, how we, we try to do what we can. And, uh, and there's lots of things that we're doing here, but, uh, but how do we connect with each other in that challenge? I guess that's the question. Thank you. Anybody else want to respond to that, that question? Uh, here, I would like to respond that uh, we need to inculcate in the minds of the persons that trees are the lungs of the planet Earth. So mm -hmm. if the lungs of the planet Earth would be chopped down, then how could the people of this planet can survive and oxygen without oxygen we are not able to survive so this is a big thing to inculcate in the mind of the person that we need to promote trees because they are the lungs of the planet earth thank you i, I love that the lungs of the planet are the trees that's that's excellent navi thank you Anyone else? Never fear, I have another question for you. 
What do you think are the biggest gaps in community-based healthcare adaptation to climate change? Like what are we missing? What is there still to be done? You can either drop it in the um, chat or unmute yourself. Not to leave you hanging there, Beth. This is Siobhan from the Bahamas. I'd like to say perhaps from my perspective, one as a humanitarian and the other as a small island developing state uh, resident. And also third and more importantly, I feel as a tourism major or a former tourism major, localization, understanding, and I think it taps into the question about faith as well, understanding the local culture of the people in which we're, we're supposedly serving. So I think it goes a little bit into what Navid is saying. So we like to think that medicine, traditional medicine may be a faux pas. And to some degree, it is not the all and all. However, we have to understand too that cultural preferences, religious preferences, all of those things serve as barriers to us effectively serving and getting buy-in from these communities. So I think uh, more research, greater appreciation for uh, the environments in which we're supposed to be working in, because you know the overall theme of humanitarianism is do no harm. And that means that we have to understand the people. We cannot go in with the perception of we know everything because the fact of the matter is we do not. So in order for us to be successful as organizations through healthcare, through understanding climate change, we have to know how do people build? What are the environments in which they live in traditionally? And how can we help them adapt their current situations? Because the fact of the matter is, when we bring in expensive items, it is unsustainable. So how can we help them uh, improve while appreciating what their norm is and still allowing some level of longevity? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that you are singing my song there. Um, localization, know, know the people, know what they need, know what they want, um, and how to help them where they are. That's, that's awesome. Thank you, Siobhan. Anyone else? Where are the biggest gaps? Where are we seeing gaps? And what, what might we be missing? Maybe just to spur on the same question, Augustine Osford asked, what is the church's role in mitigation of ozone depletion aside in addition to tree planting? What are other, other methods, other modes of mitigation of ozone depletion? Beth, I would circle back to, um a previous question and make the point again that one of the biggest contributions that we as Christians and our churches could make is to uh, include creation care as, as part of our discipleship understanding um, to make it more of a priority um, to kind of push back against the idea that um, we're leaving this and it's all going to burn um, understanding that we've operated under for so long. Um, can I just add to that uh, from the UK? Um, I, I fear just getting uh, faith-based groups worldwide and, and the church in particular um, really involved in this as a, as a key issue to take a lead on this, to link up with others, to speak from the pulpits and so forth. We've got a wonderful organization based in the UK called Arrocha. Some of you may know about it, A-R-O-C-H-A. Uh, they work in about 18 different countries, but in this country, they've set up an organization called Eco Churches, 
And there are now several hundred churches which have made a specific commitment um, to be caring for creation. And they get a special label, either gold, platinum, or silver. Um, and some cathedrals have got this, and it's become very well known. And um, so it's bringing together a whole group of people, a whole group of churches which are passionate about this, and they come together and encourage each other and then spread the word out to other churches. Um, and that's happening in other parts of the world through uh, Russia. So um, just one thought that that's a really critical thing for faith leaders to be involved, and right from the time when they first go to seminary. Perfect. Thank you, Ted. And someone put in the chat, all faith groups, not only the Christian faith, but exactly. um, that this is dealt with by all faith groups. Thank you all so much. Um, would either of our speakers, Dan or Karim, would you like to have a, a brief closing remark before we finish today? I just thank you. Uh, what a wonderful uh, time together. What a wonderful subject topic. I would also like to thank CCIH for providing us a platform to share our experiences. And uh, we are also thankful to the technology like Zoom and these things, which have made possible to have uh, shared knowledge and definitely we have learned many things from the experience of the Haiti and what are the things they have came to know about Pakistan. So we need to work collectively to overcome the issues, specifically environment related issues because it is a matter of life and death for all of us. So we, if we will not take action now, so our future generations will say that why you haven't not taken action at that time. And uh, we need to reduce the carbon footprinting by uh, adopting the latest technologies like solar panels and uh, electric vehicles, which are very much important. They are environment friendly but it will take time and some policy level decisions will, would also be required from the big organizations like United Nations and they need to uh, sup, uh, press the nations to adopt the climate adaptation measures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Navid. Um, you'll see that Carolyn um, dropped in a, a really, really short um, one question feedback uh, document. So if you would go ahead and do that, the answers to those um, will help us to, um, to improve the, the programming. I want to thank you all so much for being here with us today. Thank you for taking your time, the time out of your day uh, to engage in this important issue. Um, there is also a comment in the, the chat about if there would be um, any CCIH members who would welcome a formation of a CCIH climate change working group. So add that to your, your comments as well. Thank you all for participating. It was such a joy to be with you and uh, may God bless the rest of your day evening. <laughs>